Grip with your knees and keep your eyes straight ahead between my ears. Don't look at the ground. If you think you're going to fall, just grip harder and sit up straighter. Ready? Now, for Narnia and the North. This is Pints for Jack, Season 5, Episode 52, The Horse and His Boy, Part 1. Good morning, everyone. Pints for Jack is your favourite weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where Andrew, Matt and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we read The Four Loves and A Severe Mercy, as well as had an ecumenical month where we invited Lewis fans from diverse religious backgrounds. And we had an apologetics month where we interviewed apologists about the various arguments which were favoured by Lewis. But now it is time for our Narnian Chronicle of the Season. And the working titles for this book included Narnia in the North, The Horse That Stole the Boy, and The Desert Road to Narnia. It's the book which is dedicated to Douglas Gresham and his brother, The Horse and His Boy. And to help us on our journey to Narnia and the North, back by popular demand is Dr. Kristen Ditchfield Lazo. Dr. Lazo, welcome back to the show. It's great to be with you all again. Thank you so much for having me. I know people always say like, wait, how did I say it? The privilege is all mine. Um, but genuinely, it's I'm so excited for this because the last time you blew my mind. Because that was my first time ever. I was like, wow, we've had Andrew this whole time. And Dr. Lazo, Kristen, she's been over here. And I'm like, what are we doing? She's phenomenal. <laughs> I love this. Oh, my. The beautiful part of Andrew joining us with this was just getting Kristen. <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, me too. Well, I was going to say one thing, but me now too. that's the new thing. <laughs> but Andrew so well bridges like David and I. David's got a lot of the heady stuff, and I try to just bring it to like like the personal a lot. And Andrew like bridges it beautifully. And then you come, and I'm like, holy cow! Oh. You just take it to a whole other level. Like the I'm walking away thinking, wow, what she just said just moved me spiritually and like stirred something in me. And so. This one, particularly the, the last third of this book, is packed with so much stuff. I cannot wait to oh see what goodness. you bring into this. I'm excited. Oh, I, this, is, this is one of my favorites. I'm just so excited to get to join you all for this. Um, I love Horse and His Boy, and it's so full of rich and powerful, I mean, life-changing truths. Yes, uh, truly. When Kristen and I were courting, every time she would visit, I would try to press upon her this or that first edition you know, from my stash. And... Um, she before long she's like listen i'll take it if you want me to but i have a master plan to own them all <laughs> <laughs> and so now she does and one of those is an american first edition third printing i'm holding it up to the microphone so that our listeners can hear it <laughs> this, is, this is what it sounds like opening and closing um and as you mentioned david it says dedicated to uh to david and douglas gresham but uh Mine also says, and to Andrew with blessings, Douglas Gresham. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's been my, my prize. Also, I couldn't decide like if I was a child and this was dedicated to me, would I look at it as a good thing or a bad thing? Am I the one? Because I feel like a big theme we're going to get into this is this book is so much like humbling the, mm -hmm. the prideful and exalting the humble. I'd be like, if this was dedicated to me, which one am I? <laughs> like, <did> I <laughs> yeah. like, that's literally what I'd be thinking. And all about what you value. Yeah. Yeah. So Andrew's just showed us the book that he really cares about. And I also have a book, which I think is amazing. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes. Listeners, he's holding up Kristen's Family Guide to Narnia, her best-selling book, where she goes through uh, each of the chronicles chapter by chapter and looks at the scriptural significance. So, Well done, David. Yes, nice. Nicely done. <laughs> well, what are you all drinking? Well, I have something special. Ooh, <laughs> what do you got? I am calling it a Tashban Mule. No way. It's got a Moscow mule. <laughs> well, it's it's got bourbon in it. Uh, yeah, I suppose you could call it a Kentucky mule, but I thought Tashban mule was far more appropriate given this book that we're going to be visiting Tashban and we are going to meet a certain ass. <laughs> Actually, I think that you should I think you should call it the Rabidash. <laughs> <laughs> I did make it quickly. <laughs> he is a, a Tashban mule. <laughs> that ass, that's for sure. I love that I feel like I understand these jokes. You know, this is good now that I've read this book. I'd be totally on the outside as of two days ago if you guys were making these jokes. Wow, you've just read it for the first time? Uh, it was my first time, yes. Oh, I can't wait to hear what you thought. 
I come here fresh. I wanted to hold back all thoughts because I actually did have initial thoughts. I was like, we got to wait till we're recording. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember the time in the last millennium when I read it for the first time. <laughs> 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 we have actually discovered our mugs. I uh, I found my keep calm and drink tea mug, which sounds like a, a good plan in the middle of a move. And uh, so I am drinking uh, Earl Grey. Oh, I'm impressed. Well done. Yes. And I'm using my Maudlin College mug and um, drinking uh, Harney and Sons hot cinnamon spice. A little fruity, but I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> And I need to throw out another thank you to Bud Summers because I am continuing with his scotch, drinking it neat. It's the – Andrew, do you know how to say is it? Ab, ab, Aberlour? Aberlour. Aberlour. All right. Yeah. Phenomenal. And I and I, because he was so generous with his gift, I have the 16-year aged. Ooh, and, and this man. is – Honestly, like I always fall back to McAllen or um, Doers when I want to go much more reasonably priced. This is probably in my top three. I love this. This is phenomenal. It's smoky, isn't it? Not like that much okay. because I'm not like a big log. I mean, I enjoy log of because it's really nice, but it's still a little bit more smoky for me. I definitely am not a, a Lafroy person, way too smoky. Um, I like this. There's just a, a little hint of peatiness. Okay. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to finding a new uh, new liquor store here in in the Orlando area. Kristen and I have just uh, moved to Winter Garden, Florida, just outside of Orlando, so uh, right near the mouse. And looking forward to once we unpack our boxes um, and my Scotch glasses. I think we found a couple, um, but finding a place and and spending Bud Summer's gift on uh, yeah, I hear that Lafroy or the uh, the Lagavulin 16 is hard to find, mm -hmm. and I swear that I had half a bottle of it, but I haven't been able to find it in the move, which is very distressing. <laughs> in any case, so today we are toasting uh, our Patreon supporter, Professor Marvin L. Bittinger, and so Professor Bittinger, we pray that you your life would always be pointed towards Narnia and the North. Cheers. 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 Oh, wait, I've got my ding. I knew you were going to get that. That was a, David, did you listen to our episode? I did. Best ding I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> wow. I probably, uh, I probably peaked the, uh, the recording there. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we start working through the chapters, as we heard, Matt, this is your first time going through the horse and his boy. So we'll obviously go through stuff in more detail, but what were your overall impressions? Yes. Yeah, so, well, so first of all, let me actually just confirm one thing before I make this comment. David, is this your favorite one in the series? It is indeed. Okay. I thought so. So I'm going through it with this in mind. In the first like, I don't know, six, seven, eight chapters, I'm like, what was David thinking? It's just, just like, <laughs> I was really struggling with it. I'm like, I'm trying to see what David is thinking. And then it just like, bam, like 150 pages in, the last third just comes with truth after truth after truth after truth. And the things that usually draw me in are when there's truths like scattered throughout. So that's why I was a little struggling in the beginning. I wasn't like seeing a ton of truths in the beginning, not realizing it was setting the stage to like come with a big bang. And so I loved it, honestly. The ending, the – well, I don't want to like dive into all the different themes. But I've already obviously alluded to the exalted versus the humbled. I think that's just an incredible theme. And so I can't wait for us to dive into that into more detail. Uh, there's like two other themes that I'll, I'll hold back a little bit, but I do like that identity with the Shasta, the theme, um, having that fatherhood. I, th I think there's a lot of really cool themes in here that tie together in the end. Mm. And what did you think about it being a prequel? And, and did you remember that we heard about the story in the silver chair? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't remember that. And when you say prequel, like, was this, is this meant to be the very beginning one? This this book actually takes place during the 15-year reign of the kings and queens in the Chronicles of Narnia. So it's while they are there, although it comes, I don't know, fifth in the series, it, it actually, in the reordering, the dastardly uh, Tashian reordering, <laughs> um, uh, they have it third because it happens during the course of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Hmm. And so it kind of looks back at some of the events, um, even at, although Lewis wrote it after Lion, Prince Caspian, Voyage of the Dawn, Treader, Silver Chair. I swear I'm not a politician, but my answer is I wouldn't really care one way or the other. I didn't think like I was reading it. If, if, if someone read it in the third order versus this order, I don't think it would have. Like I didn't read it and think like a bunch of stuff before really helped me with it, other than Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe, obviously, with the, yeah. the Pevensey children. Um, 
So I guess I don't have a strong opinion. I'm sorry, David. <laughs> that, that's allowed. That's allowed. Uh, and just as an FYI, some people like to talk a lot about what they see as problematic in this book. Uh, but rather than derailing the discussion, Dr. Devin Brown will be coming on the show in episode 54. So after we finish this, and we'll talk about those in depth. I also want to mention that um, Diana Glyer in conversation has mentioned that this is one of the most meaningful of the Narnias and her favorite, uh, I believe, is what she has said. And so she loves it. And Paul Ford points to Erebus as kind of the pivot figure in the arc of Lewis developing believable female characters. And so if you put Out of the Silent Planet with almost no females at one end until he have faces at the other Erebus and the horse and his boy really is is right there in the middle. And that certainly has to has something to do with a certain person who helped Lewis write his greatest book, Do We Have Faces? Have a drink. <laughs> I think that you kind of see the presence of Joy Davidman here in this book. And everybody's dutifully drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start working our way through the book. And so the way this is going to work for each chapter, I'll read my summary hopefully in the high Kalorman style, <laughs> and then we'll chat about it with an emphasis on Kristen because she knows more about this than all of us. So, on to chapter one. During the golden age of Narnia, in a land to the south called Kalorman, there was a boy called Shasta. He lived with his supposed father, Ashish, a fisherman. Shasta's life is hard, and he dreams of the lands to the north. One day, a great lord, a Takan, stops at their home. Shasta overhears the Takan's conversation with Ashish and discovers that the man he thought was his father actually found him in a boat after some great shipwreck. Shasta wonders out loud about the character of the Takan and, to his great surprise, the Takan's horse, Bree, speaks to him and he says that they should both flee to Narnia from where Bree was stolen as a young foal. And so, while the adults sleep, the two of them head north, with Shasta learning how to ride as they go. Does the word longing come to people's mind? <laughs> yes. I love that right from the beginning of this. And there's definitely echoes of the northernness that Lewis speaks about in Surprised by Joy, his longing for things of the north. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's an echo also about the, uh, the he would le look eagerly to these mountains and it's his longing for the mountains of Morn. Um, he also sounds, um, sounds a really kind of common folktale theme uh, the boy arrives to Ashish in a basket, and this is what happens to Moses. This is what happens, I think, to Perseus. Uh, certainly happens to Tristan as well. And so Lewis is really kind of sounding some of the classical and mythical themes here. I love the verse in Jeremiah 6.16 that says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Many of us are looking, longing, searching for something, and scripture always encourages us, ask, seek, and you will find. And that's what's about to happen to Shasta as he recognizes this longing and begins on his journey. He will find what it is he's seeking. As I was rereading the chapter this time, the scripture that popped into my head as I was going through this chapter was, I think it's from the Psalms, where it says, a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Well, that's apparently also true of Narnia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And what I love about this is you just set the stage. This is going to be this journey, this seeking. And obviously, we're only talking about chapter one right now, but we know that when we seek this one, as we're going to see on this, Aslan is with us on the journey. Christ is with us on this journey. Yes. But it's not always going to be easy. Right. And there's going to be difficulties. And sometimes the difficulties we're going to be like frustrated with, not realizing their gifts. I really loved that theme in here of just the graces that are going to come, um, even if we don't see them that way. And so, yeah, I'm excited for us to unpack this. One of the big themes for me in this book is the question of identity. And I noticed that Lewis's wording is really careful in this chapter. We're told that Shasta called Ashish father, not that he actually was his father. Mm -hmm. And even when Shasta introduces himself to Brie, he says, I'm called Shasta which is how you would say it in French and a bunch of other languages, I am called, or I call myself, whatever. So it's about what he calls himself. And when he discovers that he's not actually Ashish's son, he even wonders if he could be the son of a god. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. And looking at this with Christian eyes, oh, we are, in a, at least in a sense, and we are certainly made mm -hmm. in a sense. Well, and the phrase he uses, why I might be anyone, um, this any uh, word is is a, an, a word to conjure with. Um, you remember Diggory, a magician's nephew, 
just think of what another world might mean. You might do anything. You might find anything. Peter says, oh, that old, that old boy will let us do anything that we want. And so anyone, anything is usually a positive, a phrase of positive possibility in Lewis. And so, yeah, and, and we'll find out in the end of the end of the book that actually, well, we should wait for episode two for that. <laughs> and I love that the horse recognizes, says, of course you have. That's because of the blood that's in you. I'm sure you're true Northern stock. Mm. I think that's great because it's like, Andrew, you and I just talked about this when we were recording the a severe mercy level that or <laughs> level <laughs> severe mercy uh, conversation of the the fact that that longing that identity that's within us that kind of it calls us constantly and no matter how far away there's like this whether it's really subtle or it's a little bit louder like there's this longing inside of us that's drawing us near and it's due to our identity that we have the image of God placed within us that that northern stock. Well, and some of what's going on here too, I think, is Lewis is grappling with the death of his father and his abominable way that he treated him. And so you say, or he says early in the chapter, he knew that a boy ought to love his father. And so this is something that I think Lewis struggled with. And so here's here's Storgy, you know, we're in our four loves season and here's Storgy evidencing itself right away. I just, as we were talking here, I couldn't help but think of one of the sort of epic all-time Lewis quotes, the ones that even people who know know Lewis know. (laughs) It's on the internet everywhere in all these memes that if we find in ourselves a longing, right, you'll probably have the exact wording, but we find in ourselves that longing that can't be fulfilled by anything in our world. It's probably because we were made for another world. And certainly that's what, what Shasta learns. Well, and that's, I mean, I think that that's particularly poignant because Lewis, I'm not sure if that was in uh, the broadcast talks, but that's in Mere Christianity, which has just come out a year earlier. So there's uh, there's something there. I may ask my wife to grab um, from my shelf. Oh, yeah, the Companion to Narnia. We are, uh, I, we each have our own study and I have just put all of my books, my Lewis books on the shelves. Well, while she's doing that, I actually had another Four Loves connection because we're told that Shasta is really sorry that he's going to have to leave the donkey when they flee. And the Four Loves reminded us this season that nobody could ever hate a donkey. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, and there may be an echo of Lord of the Rings where, uh, with Bill the Pony mm-hmm. and Sam's reluctance to leave behind Bill. And that had just come out right around this time, too. You mentioned Shasta uh, thinking that he should love his father. Shasta's morality is interesting. He he thinks that you should love your father, but he doesn't see anything wrong with eavesdropping at a door. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, he hadn't been raised. He hadn't been raised to it. Uh, by the way, for the record, Orson his boy was begun in um, the spring of 1950 and finished in the summer of 1950, and so. This actually predates Lewis's um, uh, in-person meeting with Joy Davidman. But he, Lewis seems to write this book fairly quickly. Uh, one of, it's one of the quickest of his Narnias. And that's according to Paul Ford's indispensable companion to Narnia. And his Appendix 1 is um, a chronology of the composition and publication of all the chronicles. So listeners, money back guarantee. If you buy that book, um, Companion to Narnia, the fifth edition, and you don't like it, I'll, I'll buy it from you. <laughs> Well, shall we move on to chapter two, A Wayside Adventure. Shasta and Bree wake up the following day with Shasta sore from riding. After breakfast, Bree has a roll, causing Shasta to laugh at him, and for Bree to worry that he'll seem uncultured in Narnia. They discuss their plans to pass through the great city of Tashban, and then cross the desert into Arkhanland and then on into Narnia. Several weeks later, while travelling at night, Bree hears another horse nearby. Both horses seem intent on avoiding each other but lion roars on either side push them together. After crossing a river, Shasta and Bree discover that they are alongside a talking horse called Hwin and her well-born rider, a Tarkina named Aravis. Although distrustful of each other at first, the four agree to escape to Narnia together. And once again, we see a little flexible morality in here, don't we? Are you talking about the raiding? <laughs> <laughs> and the saddlebags and the, and the swiping, yeah. Well, I'll just I'll point out in setting the foundation and in, in we'll unpack it many chapters later, but we have Bree who comes across a bit more of a, a confident, prideful horse with a very humble rider, Shasta. And we have Wynn who comes across very humble with a much more prideful rider, 
of what is it Erevis? Am I saying that right? Erevis. Erevis. Yeah. Sorry, good. Mm-hmm. Um, that will play an interesting role much later in the book, but I'll just yeah. make that statement right now. I also think here we're uh, even more properly introduced to what I see as one of the major overarching themes. And, you know, in a very real sense, uh, Shasta is making a journey from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. Mm -hmm. And we have a Calarman, which is all slavery and and idol worship and a caste system and very much, you know, uh, all this hierarchy and rules and uh, it's greed and pride and power and uh, lust are all exalted. And there's a culture of slavery here that that Shasta has been caught up in, that Bree and Huynh have been caught up in, but they're going to, they're on a journey for freedom. They're on a journey to become citizens of the light, to walk in the light. And we'll see the contrast when we meet all the characters from Narnia, that even their kings and queens don't treat their citizens uh, with the kind of contempt and disrespect. Um, you know, it's it's a whole different system, a whole different approach to how we treat one another, how we live in our freedom, our morality changes, right? Mm-hmm. We learn um, how to how to live, a, you know, a life of of honor and respect and civility and dignity, and, and watching them make that that journey and gradually um, become more acclimated um, is part of the story, I think, here too. Well, and I think that while they have some travel squabbles, which uh, arise anytime anybody travels, you know, with anyone else, um, I've been noticing as as I've been looking it over again, uh, like Christian was saying, there's this sense of civility that he, I mean, Bree appeals to, um, to to Shasta and says, "Oh, no, 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 let her finish her story." And it's it's almost like the the first part of of mere Christianity. Oh, give me a bit of your orange, I gave you a bit of mine. Um, but there's actually, um, although the the men in this, the males in this book, kind of end up looking a little, a lot worse than the females much much of the time. There is a real kind of civility and mutual kindness going around. So um, when Shasta sits down and starts eating the meat pasty from the uh, from the saddlebags, uh, Bree had a few more mouthfuls of grass to keep him company, and so there's good hospitality there. Um, the next, uh, and I'm sure that we'll explore this a little bit more fully when Bree, you know, has a has a roll on the grass to scratch his uh, scratch his back. He says, "Does it really look funny?" He asked in an anxious voice. "Yes, he yes it does," replied Shasta. "But what does it matter, right?" So there's a gentleness with him and and an invitation to uh, to to kind of a mutually accepted ridiculousness, which is I think one of the <laughs> kindest things that we can do for our friends. Right, I think that we've modeled that pretty well here at Nights with Jack too. <laughs> and certainly, Kristen is very indulgent of my own ridiculousness. God bless her. I love it. One thing that I'm kind of ashamed to admit, but since we're talking about humbling ourselves, uh, I'm ashamed to admit that it took me so long to realize that the horse names are horse sounds, like Bree and Huin, like Huini and Bray. And then the funny thing in this chapter is that now that we've met both of the horses. The question of ownership arises. Uh, you know, it's like, well, you might as well say that you're her human. And this was another thing that I didn't realize for a long time: the the quirkiness of the title. It's the horse and his boy, mm-hmm. whereas we would normally say the boy and his horse. I think that was Warney's. I believe that that was Warney's suggestion. Oh, well done, Badger. Yes. <laughs> yes. By the way, the reason you should be ashamed because Paul Ford's <laughs> marvelous book, <laughs> Companion to Narnia. Literally, when I met Paul Ford in 2006 at a conference uh, in San Diego with the Lewis Foundation, I literally, as I saw him across the room, I was in tears because almost everything good that I have ever thought about Narnia before I started reading my wife's book um, good save. came from Paul Ford. Um <laughs> And in the first, the first sentence of the entry on Bree, it says, the strong dappled stallion who carries Shasta to Arkenland and horse and his boy, his full name is Brihi Hini Brini Bruhi Huhi Ha, which sounds like a horse's neigh. So, <laughs> and he's a Catholic guy, David. I mean, there you go. Well, in my defense, I was eight at the time. So I hadn't read too many encyclopedias about Narnia just at that time. 
Well, and I'll pop in here and just say, if anybody, if any of our listeners have have read the book and and you find that you're hearing us pronounce the names differently uh, for the different places and the different people, yeah, because when I was six or seven and I read this for the first time, I didn't know how to pronounce any of those names. And some of the names, my I have my own quirky pronunciation that was how I figured it out. <laughs> and and who knows what the the right and wrong is? I There's- think. Very few of the names that Lewis actually um, says how he pronounces them. But in one of the letters to children, he said that he pronounces it Aslan. So there you go. Yeah. Oh, and wait, shoot. I was just listening to the, David, you probably ended up listening to the Weight Center podcast. Mm -hmm. Aslan, doesn't that come from either Arabian Nights or a Shakespearean play? Which one was it? It's a Turkish word that means lion. That's what it is. Arabian Nights. Then there's my answer. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, you can find um, you can find Aslan coffee shops all over Turkey, and having just moved to Florida and the the license plates are cheap, I think I'm going to change my license plate to for Aslan. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I like that. I wonder if these Aslan coffee houses are doing a roaring trade. Oh <laughs> wow. <laughs> I would tell you how bad that is, but I don't want to be catty about it. (laughs) Oh! All right, let's take a brief pause, and then we'll move on to the next chapter. And get back to the main topic. (laughs) The quick-wittedness of Andrew and David back and forth just blows my mind. I just drink here. I just sit here, Kristen, and just like take it in in awe, and I'm like, you know, I'm not even going to try to keep up with this. (laughs) Hey, I'm drinking tea, so there'll be no no respect to Biggles today. (laughs) Uh, well, actually, one last thing before we move on to the next chapter. It's interesting that we find out that Bree is a little cagey about his war stories. Mm-hmm. And Lewis himself was in World War I. And I remember Douglas Gresham saying that he didn't talk about it very much, except when he himself was thinking about signing up. And then Jack and Warney sat him down and they, they talked some more. Yeah, he he was troubled by nightmares for the rest of his life, and he didn't speak about it much. Um, in the middle of this chapter, it's on page 23 of the Full Color Collector's Edition, Shasta's legs ached terribly as he saddled Bree and climbed into the saddle, but the horse was kindly to him and went at a soft pace all afternoon. And I think that that's a really important word. Kindness comes from the word kin, meaning you treat them as if they're your family. I think that so much of the under underlying themes, so many of the underlying themes kind of come from who your family is and who you are related to in this book. I didn't think of this at the time until you just said it, but there does seem to be a, a mini like great divorce sub theme of hardening, strengthening on this journey. You know, you're going from the darkness to the lightness, finding the identity and, you know, tough to ride the horse, but there was a gentleness, there's a softness. It's like, it still hurt because as we go from, you know, pagan ways or pre-Christian ways to Christian and Christ, like there's going to be some pains of letting go of ourselves and our egos and our ways and our desires and slowly being transformed. And I can't remember what it was when Shasta actually gets into Narnia. I want to say he looks at a mountain again. So he's in Narnia now, but there's still another journey up, but it doesn't look as daunting yeah. as it did before. So it's like he's he's made some progress. And so it's like, it's almost an analogy for the entire spiritual journey that you don't need to look at, I'm here and I need to get there and that looks daunting. It's like one step at a time and every step you go, the next part in front of you looks a little bit less daunting, a little mm-hmm. bit less daunting. You just keep moving forward and Christ, in, in this case, Aslan is there kind of guiding behind the scenes. You don't really know it sometimes, but he's nice. there and you trust that. Well, that's because the journey up the mountain it, it offers a, a, an invitation to dance. And if you will accept the invitation <laughs> or roll. to dance. <laughs> yes, or roll. That's excellent. <laughs> And then, but then that accepted invitation to joy will uh, give you more vision for for what's coming. Till he faces. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to chapter three, <laughs> and we can find till he faces there. Hey, you were the guys that found your mugs. You have to know British slang for that to be funny, but trust me, it's hilarious. Anyway, chapter three. Yeah, I didn't get that in the slightest. <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it at all. A mug is the face. Yeah, we found our mugs. Ah, well done, David. That was subtle. Chapter three, at the gates of Tashbarn. <laughs> Aramis tells her story in the high Kalomen style to her new companions. She recites her prestigious lineage all the way back to the Kalomen god Tash. She explains that after her mother's death, her father, Kidrash Takan marries again and Aravis's new evil stepmother arranged to marry her off to a much older man. 
Aravis rides into the woods to kill herself, but is stopped at the last moment when her horse, Hwyn, intervenes and tells her about the free land of Narnia, and the two plan their escape. Aravis tells her father that she is going into the woods for the traditional three-day pre-marriage rituals. She then flees with Hwyn and sends a diversionary letter to her father. Afterwards, the horses and their riders discuss how to make it past Tashban, finally agreeing to disguise themselves as peasants, pass through the city, and rendezvous at the tombs of the ancient kings just in front of the desert. Hmm, I hadn't noticed this, I'm sure you have. Is that three-day preparation, does that remind us of David? Go disappearing for three days when Saul is hunting him? Um, I, I don't know that I would make that connection. I don't see that. that a biblical illusion my wife didn't write about. <laughs> wow. wow. It's or because echo. it's not there. Yeah, you know what, what, it's an echo. <laughs> what, I, what I really uh, focused on, I think, as, as I reflected on this chapter, I mean, Bree's pomposity is really in, in full flower here. We get to see him just being the expert about everything and being very full of himself and of course, the scripture reminds us that pride goes before a fall. He's got that coming. In the meantime, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 2 tells us, the man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. And Bree just thinks he knows it all. And, and here, but we have a beautiful contrast with Quinn and her humility and her gentleness. And even the way when she's correcting Bree, which she hesitates to do, but is very gentle. A few times she speaks up and very gently corrects him. She does it in such a humble way, uh, full of grace. And, you know, as a woman, I, I can't help but think of one of those scriptures that I, I think all of all uh, Christian women, <laughs> we all have uh, take pause and reflect on in 1 Peter 3, 4, where it talks about the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, mm. which is of great worth to God or in God's sight. Mm. And he, uh, when ab absolutely personifies that gentle uh, spirit, that unfading beauty uh, throughout the whole story. I mean, I think she's probably the only one who really doesn't have a trajectory of, of you know, being confronted with her sin and having to, to grow and repent and having to turn around. She She's already on that path and she's learning slowly and gently, but it, it's ever increasing in grace as opposed to having a come to Jesus moment, so to speak. So good. Wynn is, Wynn is amazing. And like, you are right. She's, she's, there's, there's a gentleness, there's a graceness and, and a humility. And she's the one that saves her from death. Like she's literally going there to commit suicide. And it's when in her gentleness that, that changes the entire trajectory of a person's life. And I love that. Wait, a female, a strong female lead character who is about to uh, kill herself, but then hears a divine vo voice encouraging her not to. Hmm. Where have we read that before? Hmm. Reach. Everybody take a trip. <laughs> Wait, which one are we no, talking about, guys? I'm I'm finally reaching you, David. <laughs> which one are we talking about? I'm losing I'm missing this. It's it's Orwell who tries to commit suicide at the end of this. <laughs> that makes sense. It wasn't Lewis's best book. It's not very memorable to me. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, that it's not very memorable to you, I think speaks more highly of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true, actually. <laughs> I think there's probably a little bit of wordplay going on, too, because the word for horse in Icelandic, in Old Norse, is hross. Hmm. And you, we have met the hrosa um, in Out of the Silent Planet, or we will next year, right? Perhaps. This year, next season. Next season, yeah, right. Um, so Quinn, uh, I think that there's a, a, a an etymological joke, because... Quinn, if you if you switch the H and the W, you get Quinn, like a Whinny, uh, which is also you know stolen from Paul Ford. But I think that that's also kind of an echo of what Lewis is doing with um with the with the Old Norse. There's also another allusion to uh, or an allusion to planet Narnia. It, Michael Ward makes the case that Mercury is the god over um, over the horse and his boy. And in this chapter, we find that in the turbans, they wore steel or silver caps, some of them set with jewels and one with little wings on each side. So a cap with little wings on it is, of course, mercury. And so that's one of the proofs that Michael Ward offers up. What I love about this chapter is Bree's enthusiasm for storytelling. Mm. And this is actually one of the first things about Kalorman culture that we see praised. Mm -hmm. And when I gave my summary, I made a point of explaining that Aravis gives her lineage all the way back to the god Tash. Andrew, is there another book that Lewis has written where people trace their lineage back to some god? Um, yeah, 
As a matter of fact. <laughs> Am I still allowed to drink if David brought it up? <laughs> <laughs> Just checking the rules of this drinking game here real quick. <laughs> Especially required to drink if, yes. Um, uh, remember that Barty and Ansett both have this attitude about, about the royal princesses because they have divine blood in them. So, hmm. yes, absolutely. Had I known the rules work this way, I'd be bringing up Till We Have Faces a whole lot more. <laughs> Uh, it's not too late. <laughs> no, we've got a lot of chapters. You need to pace yourself. Yeah, yeah you're right. It's, it's interesting that I, th I think um, in some circles, some parts of uh, Christianity, some expressions of it have really downplayed storytelling and literature and the arts and beauty, at, you know, just to really solidly focus on truth. And many, I see, at least in, in my experience, I see um, many churches coming back to rediscovering that that st good storytelling is part of how we tell mm -hmm. the truth, mm -hmm. how we communicate truth in a powerful way. And so I love that Brie appreciates this one thing about the, the Calarmine culture is that they do know how to tell a good story. They do <laughs> have an appreciation for that. I think that this echoes Lewis's friendship with Tolkien. And of course, he's in the putting the final touches on The Lord of the Rings in 1950, uh, which he had started writing right after The Hobbit. So for over, you know, over 10 years, 12 years. And Lewis read every word of The Lord of the Rings in manuscript. Um, and according to Tolkien, his encouragement was invaluable. And Lewis was long my only listener, my only hearer, Tolkien says. And so I think this value of story um, kind of echoes what the Inklings did. And Lewis is still kind of fresh uh, from, from the end of the Inklings in 1949. And so uh, yeah, I think that this and Lewis and Tolkien are both, I think, opposing medieval culture or modernist culture because narrative storytelling had fallen into real disfavor in the 1940s and 1950s amongst literary scholars. And so you've got this kind of uh, obscurist and and ridiculous, um, you know, these these stories that kind of don't go anywhere. Think of Ulysses or Mrs. Dalloway or, or narrative is a lost art and modernism rejects narrative as a voice of truth or meaning, uh, important meaning. And Lewis and Tolkien in these stories and Lewis especially here by investing the woman and the Southern culture, this, this Middle Eastern culture with the praised value of storytelling is I think holding up to his young readers. I think he's fighting against modernism by valuing stories and by echoing so many stories um, in, in his Narnian Chronicles. I've often said that if Lewis is an evangelist for anything, he's an evangelist for good reading. And I think that this chapter contributes to that. Mm -hmm. mm. And pushing people to go and read Arabian Nights, which I have recently just started. Hmm. And although there are some positive things about Kalorman culture, we also now start to see some more of the negative ones, namely forced marriage. And I would say this is yet another reason why this book should not be read early on. You need to be a few more books deep yeah. before you start getting to these heavier topics, which is what happens in publication order as you go on. <laughs> here, here. And one other thing that I noticed in this chapter is that we have something of an inner ring because Aravis and Bree know many of the same people and have visited many of the same places, and Shasta feels left out, which points us back to the four loves and friendship and how a friendship ring can become exclusionary. Hmm. Yeah, I think that – I wonder if if there's – Yes, they're, they're, he may feel as if it's an inner ring, but I think that some of that may be jealousy for being outside the inner ring for most of his life. Totally. And Lewis certainly felt that way. Once he uh, left boarding schools and went to his tutor, he was deliriously happy, but he did miss that kind of company. And so he joined every society he could once he got to Oxford. <laughs> um, I think there's also a gender thing happening here because it's Erebus and Brie, a female and a male, who are having that kind of what you two experience. Yeah. Mm. And, and Bree needs to be corrected. Uh, in this chapter, he says, uh, when he hears Huynh approaching, he says, that's not, that's not a farmer's riding, not a farmer's horse either. Can't you tell by the sound? So there's some classism going on. That's quality, that horse is. And it's being ridden by a real horseman. I can tell you what it is, Shasta. There's a Tarkon under the edge of that wood. Not on his war horse, no too light for, for that, on a fine blood mare, I should say. So he's mistaking Erebus for a Tarkon. So there's some gender stuff kind of happening here. And I think that you've got an, an evening out of the genders to some degree. Yeah. 
Well, he's sounding very pompous and full of himself and an expert on everything. And and he's also sounding a little sexist and a little, you know, and a little elitist for someone who claims to be so, uh, you know, such a, an exemplary citizen of the democratic uh, Narnia, uh, in a sense. I mean, he's, he's, he's a little, he's a snob. He's, and, uh, he's steed-splaining. Yes, there you go. Steed-splaining. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, but, you I don't know, know if I would have gone with like mare staining or something. Wow. Sure. Yeah. He could use a little mare splaining. And in fact, she does some mare splaining and it's redemptive for him. And I think that that's certainly kind of what's happening, uh, what's happening with Lewis too. Yeah, nice. Good point. Well, on to chapter four, when Shasta falls in with the Narnians. Our travelers put on their disguises and enter Tashban. After a brief run-in with some guards, they begin making their way through the city but are often forced to stop in order to make way for the nobility. On one occasion, a group of Narnian royalty pass through and they grab Shasta, mistaking him for Corin, the runaway prince of Arkenland. Shasta and the Narnians arrive at their accommodation where Shasta discovers that King Edmund and Queen Susan are visiting the Kalormin prince, Rabadash. He wishes to marry Queen Susan. It turns out that Susan doesn't want to marry him, and the chapter closes with King Edmund asking for the room to be sealed. Oh, here's where we really get to see the contrast between uh, Callerman and Narnia. And we, uh, for those of us who've read the other books in the series, suddenly uh, unexpectedly run into all these old friends, these familiar faces that we're delighted to to encounter again. Uh, and uh, we see that the freedom, the light and breeziness that, you know, those who look to him are radiant, the scripture says. And, and if there's one word to describe the the uh, Narnians in this chapter, it's radiant, you know, just full of, of mm. light and love and joy. And although some kind of dangerous things may be on the verge of happening, um, you know, they have a confidence and a freedom that is different from the, the power dynamic that we see going on in Tashvan. There's a courtliness too. And I think that the, this sense of manners and this sense of class in a positive sense. I mean, Lewis talks redemptively about hierarchy in the discarded image. Um, and although that's really roundly dismissed, um, I think unthinkingly dismissed in our age, I think there's something to it. And I love that Shasta perceives the loveliness of this, of this noble city. And also in this chapter, there's this strong, solemn, little bit frightening musical noise. And so here's an experience of the numinous, right? Something that is so powerful and so beautiful and so elevated that it was it would cause fear. This is, I think, a little bit of what uh, what is meant by the the fear of the Lord. And so, one of the things that you get in the Calamine culture that I don't think you see in any other culture as well in Narnia is this kind of fear of you know, a built in sense of awe or a sense of the numinous, a sense of propriety. And that's, I think, one of the positive things that comes out of this uh, out of this culture. Although they're very happy to call the Narnians barbarians. <laughs> Even right in front of them, I mean that's that's pretty bold, and and th- they might be courtly, but it's just me. I don't think the way they speak is quite up to the King James Bible standard that we see at the end of Wardrobe. They haven't quite got there yet. It, this is maybe they're, they're at the new King James stage at this point. Yes. <laughs> it's no, it's the Syriac Bashida. It's not not <laughs> Western courtly. It's Eastern courtly, and yeah, there certainly is a fundamental arrogance to that place, but the. The flip side of arrogance is kind of an exaltedness that I think is can be redemptive. And we see it redemptive, certainly, um, not only of Erebus, but we see one of the most redemptive people in this courtly system uh, at the end of the series in Emmeth in the last battle. He's a Calamine, um, and he's a noble. They notice something noble about his face. And David, that was you mentioned barbarians. That was a theme that did stick out to me throughout this, maybe a, a smaller sub one, but just... The contrast between the people living in darkness, as Kristen had said, unable to even see the light in a beautiful way Mm -hmm. and to even be able to like understand it. And then when they're talking about Aslan and the lion describing is a demon, like everything is twisted, essentially the way they view things, the way they see things. And I feel like as Christians, you can somewhat relate to that today's culture. I mean, people will look at Christians and be like, wow, this is so weird. They're, they're antiquated or they'll say all these weird things that just aren't even remotely true to what, how we view the beauty of it. And so there's just a big divide between the, I guess, the, the people in the darkness. I hate to make it like groups and the people into the light. <laughs> yeah. But they do all recognize they are beautiful. <laughs> they are beautiful <laughs> barbarians. Yeah. 
<laughs> True. Well, aren't we all a little resentful sometimes? <laughs> I mean, there there are people and places that we uh, we look down on, or we're critical or judgmental, and but often with that, there is a little bit of envy or resentment, uh, you know, attached, and we see that on display there as well. Hmm. My favorite is that there's garlic and onions in this chapter. It makes me want to cook. <laughs> Well, the one final thing, David, I had in this, I just thought this was a fun little sub point. But at the very end of the chapter, when they say, see the bear in his own den before you judge of his conditions. Yes. And then come live with me and you'll know me. Yeah. There's just like a really big truth in that yes. of like the false self, true self, how often we can put on an exterior. But it's like when you when you finally live with someone, it's like you're fully exposed. I think when they talk about marriage, it's like you got a mirror mm -hmm. held up to you. Um <laughs> I thought there's just a lot of little wisdom in that that comment right there. It was one of the few things in that chapter I underlined. I was like, huh, there's a lot of truth to that. Well, and Lewis has these throughout the book or throughout his books. There are these maxims like don't close yourself yes. in a wardrobe or <laughs> no horse, not even a talking horse from Narnia backs easily and come see a, a horse in his own in, in his own den. Um, there's also a very biographical note here. Did you notice in this chapter? Oh, Corin, oh, Corin, how could you? And thou and I are I such close friends ever, ever since thy mother died. And so here we have another dying mother that um, mm. that that's uh, an echo for Lewis, I think. Lewis really is like Disney at some points. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, we've got a loving parent. Gonna have to kill him off. Gonna have to kill her off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but you know what? <laughs> hey, in defense of Disney, which, I, by which we live. There was a book that came out years ago. God bless him. I don't even remember who it was that wrote it. But but some guy wrote a whole book about the evils of Disney. And his premise was, oh. you know, we know that, that Disney is evil because they always kill off the parents. Right. That, I mean, that was the whole theme of the 200 page book. And there might, you can argue whether or not Disney is evil on many, for many reasons. Um, but that's just a basic storytelling technique. If, if somebody <laughs> pointed out that if, if you have children who are main characters in a story and they have good, loving, healthy relationships with both parents, then when any crisis arrives, arises, what do the children do? They ask their parents, the parents fix it, story's mm -hmm. over. You got no story. So you, right. you have to find a way to get the parents out of the picture if the children are going to have any agency. And one of the most common ways to do that is to is to present them with a loss that, that many people have experienced. I mean, and certainly for thousands of years, many people have grown up without one or both parents. And, and that causes us to grow and mature and confront. So that's, I'm sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox. Listen, but <laughs> all, the, all the best writers have dead mothers. Lewis, dead mother. Tolkien, dead mother. <laughs> Lennon, Dead mother, McCartney, dead mother, and Orwall, uh, the author of Till We Have Faces, dead mother. <laughs> There's so much truth to what you just said, though. It made me think of, ironically, just my favorite TV shows, which are still a story arc. And I think of Suits. I've watched that since college when it would come out every season. And Mike Ross, the main character, both of his parents are passed away. I think of Yellowstone, great one. Um, the mother died. Uh Trying to think of oh, when we crashed, I was just watching. It's not like a TV show; it's like a little mini series. But again, in that one, that's actually a real story. But sure enough, the parents are totally out of the picture and all on his own. I'm like, you're right. The parents are never either they're dead or there's a bad relationship with them. Superman, Batman, Daredevil. <laughs> yeah. It just goes on. I never thought of that. It, it's something that many people can relate to, and and somebody not to get all you know. Psycholog psychologist, psychology, psychological, psychological, thank you. <laughs> Respect to All the psychological here. But, but for many of us, even those of us who have healthy relationships with our parents, even for those of us who have our parents still living, the fear of losing them is huge. And the, the growth that we go through where we uh, stop depending on them and become adults in our own right mm -hmm. and begin to take on the roles and responsibilities in preparation for losing them and for, for leading the next generation. I mean, that's, epic and so that's going to be the foundation for a lot of stories yeah mm. let's just note that this chapter ends oh edmund she cried what is it there is something dreadful in your face and now uh, <laughs> and on to chapter five which is entitled <laughs> prince corin king edmund explains that he's afraid that prince rabadash intends to keep them in tashban if susan refuses to marry him as they speak about the possibility of war between Kalormin and Narnia, the talking raven, Salopad, describes a route across the desert, which particularly interests Shasta. 
Mr. Tumnus concocts a ruse whereby they will invite Prince Rabadash to have dinner on their ship the following night, giving them an excuse to go down and provision the ship, and then to sail away after dark. The room empties and Mr. Tumnus brings Shasta some food and keeps him company, after which Shasta falls asleep. Shasta is awoken by a boy climbing in the window. It is the missing Prince Corin. Shasta briefly shares his story and Corin tells of his fights with the locals. The two of them part ways as friends, with Corin saying that he hopes they'll someday meet in Arkhamland. And Matt, I want to ask you, had you realised the relationship between the two boys at this point? Oh, absolutely not. I didn't realise until the very end. In fact, I, I didn't finish reading the book until about three hours before this. Um, <laughs> I only had like 40 pages left. <laughs> but I had listened to the Wade Center podcast last night on my way to visiting my nieces. And in that process, I'd already heard about the twin thing before. Um, I don't think I would have noticed it. I, honestly, because I was skimming really quickly the last 20 pages. I might have missed it if it wasn't for that podcast. <laughs> 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 well, it kind of echoes the Prince and the Popper and a lot of other classic stories mm-hmm. of trading places only to find out that there's a connection or a relationship there. Does anyone remember Vice Versa with Fred Savage? Or am I just the only old TV watcher here? Oh. Yep. Just me. No. Okay. <laughs> Wait, David, did you did you know though, like really early on? I can't remember now. It was so long ago. Okay. Okay. Andrew, Kristen, did you, like when you guys were reading this before, maybe like the last 40 pages when they explicitly stayed it, was it, I'm just kind of curious. It wasn't obvious at all to me. I don't think it was the first thought on my mind, but I think as the chapters unfold and or as they continue to emphasize, why would they get the mistake? Just because I've run into other, oh, other yeah. stories no, like that. I think I remember, maybe, maybe it's been so many years. It's been almost <laughs> It's been it's like been 84 40. years. I can still remember the smell years, of the pain. It's 40 years since my first reading of this. But I think having, I don't know where I came across the story of the Prince and the Popper. Um, I think I recognized that right away, that they were probably related, that you couldn't fool anybody so wise as the Narnians unless they were very, uh, they looked very much the same. Well, and a lot of TV shows, I think, have done that double, stunt double. Movies have, so, but I wouldn't have caught on. So I, you know, and if certainly if I was reading it quickly right before a podcast recording. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. By the way, Edmund said, "Do we know each other well enough?" For me to- <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> well, welcome. This is your induction. Making fun of Matt is a core staple of this show. That's what, yes. that's what I'm here for. That is my role. <laughs> She's an official full member now. Um, well, this I, finishing that, that comment is kind of funny. I've, I've gotten to know like four or five people that were listeners to this beforehand and developed like a, a friendship relationship type thing and multiple people have said i'm like really different in real life than when i am on a podcast i think you bring a a, a, a purity um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i love it and, thank and you world, keep it coming <laughs> uh, no i think that you there's a there's a a, a disingenuous or an ingenuousness a disingenuousness, Not disingenuous, an ingenuousness. There's, a, there's a freshness and a, and a willing to willingness to be yourself um and and kind of the I, I I'm not surprised that you notice the humility um, and the exaltation because I think that you bring a really refreshing humility something that um, I sometimes have been known to lack. Pause for moments of surprise. It says here. By the way, uh, in this chapter, um, we are a little land. Edmund says, and little lands on the borders of a great empire. Uh, which is a phrase that comes almost exactly or reappears almost exactly in Tilia yeah. Faces. It's true. It's here. I'm not making it up. Have another drink. <laughs> I'm all out and I got to pace myself for recording <laughs> a second episode. Well, one thing that I want to point out here is some parallels. Both Susan and Aravis are now trying to escape forced marriages. Yes. Mm-hmm. Huh. And there's also a little Easter egg. Because they talk about the moles planting an orchard, which we encountered when we read Prince Caspian. Oh, very nice. Yes, I love that. Yeah, yeah. These little connections, that that's what makes it feel like home. You know, especially for those of us who loved The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when you get to this one, oh, there, there they are. That, that's where it happened. That's how it... And the narrator yeah. even refers to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wait, David, was it the very first time you interviewed Andrew well before becoming a regular co-host with us 
I want to say I listened to it in multiple times. I want to say it was about Till We Have Faces. You pointed things out to Andrew on the episode and he was like, huh, I had never seen that before. I'm like 95% sure because I remember listening to this after I, I listened to it before we released it. Or actually, I watched the video of you two interviewing. So this would have been, I don't know, what, three years ago, mm-hmm. maybe two years ago. He promised to steal it and not cite me. <laughs> you, I yeah. remember that you are correct. That's exactly what he yeah. said. Thank you for that memory. He's like, I'm going to take that and not cite you. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember the the specific instance, but that's certainly a claim that's very familiar to me. <laughs> I think it was like kneeling on the water side or something, and there was like a bending of the knees and humility. She's in a position there. of humility. That's what it was. That was one of the wow. comments you made. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Anyways. Well, and the thing is, I mean. Yeah. I was having a text exchange with Charlie Starr uh, the other day, and he was complaining about, uh, we were chatting about something. And I said, here's the best study guide uh, of, or the best scholarly book that you can write on, on C.S. Lewis. I can do it in three chapters. Chapter one, read Lewis. No, really, read him. Read exactly what he says. Read him carefully. Read him. Chapter two, think about it. (laughs) <laughs> no, really, think about it. Turn off all other music and think about what Lewis said. Chapter three, now go back and read Lewis again. <laughs> when we, I think careful reading, there's so much depth to him about in all of his works, including uh, including the one I obsess about. But yeah, these kind of revelations come again and again. Anytime I think you take a, a careful look at Lewis and he repays what Jerry Root said, he repays careful reading. And I think that that's, one of the truest things that he said. Particularly if you love lots of food talk. This chapter was yeah. full of it. <laughs> yes. Lots of, uh, lots of delicious recipes there. Lewis said that these are the walk, walk, eat, eat books. Because he really liked walking and he really liked eating. I love to uh, just mention as, as we uh, t- close out this chapter, there's a lot of Proverbs. Again, there's some really profound Proverbs uh, from the Narnians and from the Calermines uh, all the way through. And, and you know, I, I think it's appropriate because, it you know, there's a whole book in the Bible called Proverbs. And <laughs> lest we lest we forget, um, you know, ca- yes, Calerman is a Middle Eastern culture, but so is so is the land of the Bible. So are the this, the people in Scripture. And so some of these hearing these proverbs and this way of talking, and uh, it helps me actually go back and read some of the the proverbs and also um, like the Song of Deborah in the Book of Judges. It has very much this Middle Eastern storytelling feel. Um, there's a flair there. There's an accent there um, that we can recognize in in the people of Calerman and also in the these Narnian proverbs. So it echoes of Scripture everywhere and and a familiar with that style of, of uh, truth speaking. Hmm. Well, one of my first friends uh, that I made of the, the, the year coming right after after our year in seminary, uh, a dear friend and his wife named their first son Corin, and did so after this character. So we were instantly friends. <laughs> well, speaking about being instantly friends, Lewis says that Corin and Shasta became friends. Does this match his definition of philia? Do they have a common interest? Um, yes, I'm sure they do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally trying to think of it too right now. Well, they're both on adventures, I suppose. They're both orphans. Corin still has his dad. Yeah. So does Cor. But he doesn't know it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it was a good try though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they both kind of have an adventurous, adventuresome side. And so... I don't know. I mean, I think that maybe philia happens in retrospect because they have, even though they don't know it, they have a storgy. Are you preparing to drink? Are you waiting for me to? I was just going to say, I know one thing that they've definitely both got in common. Their faces. Cheers. Oh, cheers. (laughs) Oh, David. Yes. And in looking at each other's faces, it's as if they're looking in a mirror, just like when... Yeah, um, this is fun. And I think that Jack and Warney were, I mean, they were friends because they were brothers and Warney's diaries actually, is, are, it's called Brothers and Friends. And so I think that there is, that there can be a friendship born out of Storgi. Lewis doesn't talk about it specifically in Four Loves, but but he, he experiences it with his brother, who was one of his best friends, certainly all of his life. 
Hmm. Well, it's it's interesting. I think it's a great example of, you know, they're boys of the same age, uh, exactly the same age. <laughs> um, and but they have very different personalities and they could easily uh, they could easily take offense at each other or, um, you know, be turned off by each other's differences. But I, I think what they both recognize is that the other has something that they wish they had. Uh, and, and maybe that's a twin thing, but they're they're seeing the strengths of the other person and being able to appreciate that. I mean, Shasta a little bit wishes he was Corin, and I think Corin gradually comes to appreciate more and more that Shasta has some qualities he doesn't have, and and together they they make a beautiful friendship. They make a, a beautiful brotherhood. Well, let's talk about chapter six, Shasta among the tombs, uh, but uh, nests before eggs, as people say. So here is my summary. Shasta makes his way out of the northern gates and comes to the tombs at the edge of the desert. Unfortunately, the others are not there, and it soon becomes dark. The scared Shasta is comforted by a cat. During the night, he wakes up to the sound of jackals, but they are scared off by a lion. When a terrified Shasta opens his eyes, he finds that it's only the cat from before. He promises the cat that he'll be nice to cats from now on, confessing that he once threw stones at a stray, to which the cat scratches him. After hanging around the tombs during the day, Shasta starts to think about leaving Fenania alone, when he sees a strange man leading Bree and Huynh towards the tombs. Shasta freezes, unsure whether or not this is a trap. Well, I have to say this is one of my favorite chapters. We're starting mm-hmm. to turn the corner as we talked about toward the end of the book where we start to get hit one truth after another after another. And I this is one of probably, I don't I want to say, off the top of my head, five or six scenes in the whole Chronicles that seem to speak directly to those of us who have ever felt real fear or terror or anguish in our souls. And and it speaks such incredible comfort that even to me as an adult, um, I mean, I look back in my childhood and this was one of those scenes that spoke to me about my childhood fears, my fear of the dark, those night terrors, those kinds of, of, of things that we dream and imagine and that terrifying feeling of being totally alone with your fear and it grows bigger and bigger and becomes nightmarish. Um, But here Shasta Shasta encounters help where he least expects it. And it it just reminds me so much of the Psalms where it says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Um, When we're in that loneliness, um, you know, if we if we will call on the Lord and ask him to be with us, sometimes he comforts us in amazing and surprising ways. But that reminder that he is present, even if I can't feel him, even if I can't see him, even if I mistake him for a lion or a cat, um, he is there. And to look for him, to ask him to be there. I remember as a child, uh, probably being seven years old and praying um, when I couldn't quite picture. My parents told me Jesus was with me and it was hard for me to picture that. But then I would suddenly call to mind the, uh, the image of the great lion asked at the foot of my bed. And that brought me great comfort thinking of, of scenes like this one in A Horse and His Boy. Well, and I've heard Kristen talk about this it, it, many times, and it's, it's she's just brilliant in this area. She's written a book called What Women Should Know About Facing Fear. And it's certainly a testimony to how she's let God work in her life. Um, I noticed this time in preparing for our talks, how many times Edmund encourages Susan to courage And of course, I've gone on and on about courage and Lucy um, before. Courage means heart, right? It means to have love to to a certain extent. And cowardliness and courage come up. And even before I met Kristen and knew her, I have fear underlined and 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 noted in my in my liner notes again and again. And it's uh, what I always say is that guilt and fear work the same way. As they're chasing you down, they cast a great shadow in front of you. And the thing to do with both guilt and fear is to stop and to turn and to face it with the Lord's help. And when you do, usually the fears aren't nearly as large as the shadows they cast when we're running from them. Mm -hmm. And of course, with God, we'll do all things well. And so um, to face those fears with the help of God, to be of good courage, um, to let not your heart be troubled, as our Lord commends us. Um, it's it's that's I think one of the great takeaways here. Well, and I I think one of the even just one of the practical things in this chapter where where Shasta realizes that when he's he's closed his eyes, he's allowed the terror to grow bigger and bigger, and the best thing he can do is open his eyes and look 
turn around, face it. Um, that's a recurring theme in the Chronicles. To see things well. <clears throat> is, is, to, is to, whatever it is that's frightening us, it grows bigger and bigger when we try to hide from it. But if we'll turn around and face it, look it full in the eyes, often it turns out not to be nearly as terrifying as we thought. And regardless, we can face it better uh, head on with our eyes open. Yeah. And how many times does Lewis say, well, even if it does kill us, you know, is is that the worst thing that can happen to us? No, certainly not. And so, hmm. yeah, I agree. This was the first time I was. I want to say it was the first time I was already seeing the 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 journey, the darkness to light, the identity, the northernness. But I agree. There's a turning point here because mm-hmm. at least what spoke to me very similar to what you said, Kristen. Putting myself in Shasta's shoes, he doesn't know yet about this. Aslan figure or all of this stuff. I mean, at this point in time, he has a bit of a longing in his heart. He's had this talking horse tell him there's this Narnian country and stuff. And so he has a little bit of information. He's trusting it and he's moving forward on this journey that he's been called to. But he doesn't know the end conclusion yet. He doesn't have this complete picture. He doesn't have someone who's revealing it all to him yet. He's got a bit revealed to him, but there's a lot of unknown. And up until this point, he has companions somewhat helping him. And then all of a sudden, there's just an aloneness. And I just thought of the people on a spiritual journey who turn themselves to Christ and then find themselves a bit alone, but they still need to move forward into the unknown, that desert, and cross that desert. And that fear, and it just, it resonated with me. I mean, I I, I think there's probably plenty of people on the spiritual journey who are like, wow, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, there's an unknown. There's times where you feel alone. There's times when you don't know the full plan. There's times when you, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of uncertainty in front of you. And, and I love what you said, Andrew. I was thinking something kind of similar, like the fear sometimes got blown out of proportion. You got to open your eyes. You got to see. And so I agree. This was starting to really get me. I was already excited. I thought there was something coming with identity, but this chapter really was a turning point. I, I love what you brought out there, uh, what you mentioned as you were laying the groundwork for that, that, you, you know, in one sense, uh, so far, everything that Shasta has experienced, I mean, he's ta- it's secondhand faith. Right. He's, yes, he's taking exactly the report right. of others. He and, and that's a that's a good thing. I mean, it's incredible that he's willing to, to uproot his whole life and, and make this epic journey just on the report that he hears from others, on the witness of others. Yes. Um, that that's commendable. But he doesn't really have any faith of his own yet. And he's beginning to have the experiences that will be part of his faith story mm. that he'll look back on and go, that's where. God met me. That's where Aslan mm-hmm. met me, where I where I most needed him. And this is this is the beginning of his personal faith. I like that phrasing. I think that I would love to see Brittany White do a meme about this. Um, I think that you could do uh, have a real good personality analysis um, and maybe even a chart to to judge oneself by um, when you look at what happens when somebody first meets Aslan, right? Um, Lucy, uh, Edmund feels terror. Lucy feels joy. Um, what happens to Trumpkin the first time he meets Aslan? What happens to the dwarfs uh, in the last battle when they first meet Aslan? And, you know, what happens to him? You know, oh, he's bigger than 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 he thought. And, oh, here it comes. I must have dreamed all of that, you know. And Aslan came bounding in, right? Um, so what happens, what happens when the real God shows up? Um, when the real God comes, what the half gods go or the half gods can take their proper place, uh, as we've talked about before. Well, in the culture that Shasta has been raised in, uh, the only thing that they associate with the gods is fear. Really? Hmm. And, and, it, and so here, I mean, I'm just thinking about that as you're talking about it. His natural response to anything supernatural is is fear because that's what he's been raised with. But he's going to learn a different way. Well, and if and it should be if your only God is Tash, who's this horrible, stinky bird like, you know, but you haven't read the last battle yet, Matt. So sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it should be fear. But as we find in The Great Divorce, uh, Lewis's second best book. He's constantly trying to turn the difficult things into the horses that we can ride, right? And so he's trying to put fear in its proper place and let fear have its proper work. And the fear of the Lord, of course, is the beginning of wisdom. Mm. And from this chapter, if we already knew that this was the Mercurial book, we would know that although they're separated, they will soon come back together. And that's what we hear about in the next chapter when we hear about Aravis's adventures in Tashban. Here's my summary. The narrative goes back in time to the point at which Shasta was taken by the Narnians. 
When Shasta is taken, Aravis remains calm, but moments later, a childhood friend, Lazareline, is carried down the street on a litter and calls out to Aravis. She quickly jumps into the litter, draws the curtains, and tells Lazareline to take her and her horses home. Later, they devise a plan to enter the Tisrox Palace the following night so that Aravis can pass through the Tisrox Gardens, across the river, to the tombs. As they go through the Tisrox house, they hide behind a couch in a side room, only for the Tisrox himself to enter the room with his son, Prince Rabadash, and Aravis's fiancée, the Grand Vizier, Ahoshta Takan. Hmm. Dun dun dun! <laughs> dun dun. I did like this one again too, this chapter, because... I, I, I guess I keep putting this in the context of just what I said in this last one of that spiritual journey, except now this one is Aravas is not Shasta's. And how often have we been on a journey where we decide to change our ways, but old friends can can somewhat be a thing that can pull us back and can be a temptation. And so I just I think there is a truth here when we commit ourselves and our life to Christ and we start that spiritual journey and we're trying to die to old ways that people in our old life whether friends, family, different relationships can somewhat be a tool to pull us away from that, to try to derail us from that, to um, keep us from continuing on that journey. The only thing I will say that's a little confusing is that all seems to fit here, what I just said, but at the same time, still ended up helping. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a, a, a dichotomy going on there, a bifurcation where there is like a pullback, but there seems to be, seems to be a genuine friendship still of like, I'm hoping you come back, but I'm willing to help you how you need me to help you. Um, right. I don't really know how to reconcile those two, to be honest. But I think you can tell a lot about somebody as to how they regard Lazaroline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is she a good person? Is she a good friend? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, she and we hear we have echoes of of Susan's uh, journey as well. I mean, we have a young woman who is obsessed with clothes and parties and gossip. And and not focused on the the deeper truths, the greater realities. This is our first glimpse too of what Erebus's life could have looked like, what she's le what mm -hmm. she's choosing to leave, what she finds meaningless, and has not been fulfilling to her. Uh, but she could have lived this life of privilege. This is what she left, what she's accustomed to, and what she's sacrificing in some ways. All the pleasures and the privileges she's giving up because something is more important. I guess they they stand in relief against each other. She's choosing mm -hmm. the spiritual truth. She's choosing um, the greater realities rather than parties and gossip and clothes and and you know shallow and temporary pleasures. What did Moses do? Um, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Yeah. He left the palace. He left all the privilege for something greater. Yeah, sin for a season. And and I love that you can't categorize people racially, even in this book, which, as I'm sure you'll talk with, talk about with Devin Brown, you know, Lewis often gets hammered in this book for, you know, categorizing Middle Eastern people, which is stupid and wrong. What was the chapter two of your book again? <laughs> uh, well, chapter one is read what Lewis actually said. Now go think about it. Now then read it, read him again. And, um, and so you see ridiculous people, um, but you also see offers of redemption. So there's this kind of twinning that goes on, not just between Shasta and Kor. You see it between the horses, you see it between the humans and their horses, you see it between Lacerline and you see it with Rabidash. You, and so I think that, you know, there's a ridiculousness to her, but there also, as, as Kristen pointed out, there's also another way. Yeah. Well, and to your point, um, Matt, I think, you know, Lacerline is not evil. She's just spoiled and selfish and she wants to be a good friend. She just doesn't know how she, she her eyes have not been opened. She hasn't responded to the truth. And so she does the best that she knows. She thinks she's offering the best advice, the best encouragement. And in the end, she comes through, but because she wants to be good, but but she just is a little clueless. I mean, if actually that reminds me, she reminds me a lot of the clueless movie. <laughs> <laughs> you are right. I think about it. <laughs> yeah, that is a perfect analogy of this, actually. Yeah. I never thought of that. <laughs> well, I was going to say that when Netflix are finally making all of these Narnian Chronicles, if they want a spin off series, I would love to see them do the real housewives of Tashban. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Well, and I think she doesn't have a ha she doesn't have a handbag dog. She's just got a spoiled monkey. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes. That is how I would answer, though. I think Kristen, you just answered it brilliantly. I would say she's trying to be a good friend and 
it's just a, it's just a misguided one. So yeah, I wouldn't. I would definitely not use the word evil. I wouldn't use the word great or amazing friend. No. But does she desire the best for her, but has no idea what the best is? Yes, because in the end, she does actually end up helping her. It's not like she tries to. You know, she she gives in in the end. Well, and how do we treat the people who annoy us? And how do we treat the people to whom we feel superior? How do we treat people who are who are not as smart as we are? Right. And make that really obvious. And, you know, I'm about to. Andrew, you treat me really well. So (laughs) it's true. It's true. (laughs) I I, I scoop a great distance, you know, but (laughs) partly because of my sanctity. And (laughs) but but yeah, what do we do with the people who annoy us? Those are invitations. And I think that, as we'll see later, uh, there's a there's a price to be paid for how we treat or dismiss or even commodify you know, the, the people to whom we feel superior and, you know, I, so our you world is full. Erebus in the way that she treats her friend, even though she, yeah. Absolutely. Erebus is kind and as tolerant as she knows how to be at this stage in her spiritual journey. No, but then she, she also lets Sarah Lee take a beating, right? Uh, she lets no. her servant take a beating. Her servant yes. take, but uh, yeah. And so. She's you, a work in process. Yes, she is. <laughs> um, but how you treat your servants is a is a you know, and you see that until we have faces as well. How she treats Pooby, um, and fi- and creates in her servants um, havens for later, you know. And so yes, how you treat your inferiors or those you perceive as inferior. Take a drink. <laughs> Don't <laughs> laugh. <laughs> I can't refill until the next one. I'm afraid you're going to speak too many times about till we have faces. Still, <laughs> is there anything else really to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all works Fair. in progress. For example, Lazaroline still has to understand how punishments work. My favorite line from this chapter. <laughs> Anyone I catch talking about this young lady will first be beaten to death and then burned alive. And after that, kept on bread and water for six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it, it's like a little piece of advice that I often say. Pillage, then burn. What's <laughs> <laughs> that uh, pirate T-shirt? I don't know if you've seen it. The, the the beatings will continue until morale improves. Yes. <laughs> well, we are doing a two-parter for the Horsens Boys, so let's end this first part with Chapter Eight in the House of the Tisrock. And if we recall, Lazarine said that she was such good friends with the Tisrock, yet she is very scared when he turns up. Mm. Hiding behind the house, Aravis and Lazaroline overhear the conversation between the Tisrock, Ahoshta, and Prince Rabadash. Rabadash is furious that Queen Susan has escaped. He wants his father to invade Narnia so he can have her as his wife. The Tisrock, however, is unwilling to attempt this because, although the White Witch is now gone, he knows that it must have taken great power to expel her, and he's worried that that power still remains in Narnia. Rabadash therefore proposes a plan. He will take 200 men and conquer Anvard in Arkenland. He will then go to Cape Paravel and simply abduct Susan. This will give him, his bride, and his father a military foothold just outside of Narnia. And if the plan fails, the Tisrock can say that it was all done without his permission. After Rabadash leaves, the Tisrock and Ahoshta remain. The Tisrock says that he is pleased with the plan. After all, if Rabadash dies, he has other sons. Besides, it's better for Rabadash to be distracted abroad, rather than looking to his father's own throne. Well, here we have a, we, we were just saying that Lazarine is not evil. She's foolish. She's shallow. She's mindless. Now, now we're going to meet evil. Mm-hmm. Here's where we encounter the real evil in the story. By the way, just tying up, I realized that I hadn't looked at all of my notes. Uh, Lazarine and Erebus had supper in the pillared room. Uh. <clears throat> but um, they, uh, they go to, down the colonnade, passing the great beaten copper doors of the throne room. And copper is the metal associated with mercury. So there's some more support for um, for uh, Michael Ward's thesis. So, but back to the great evil that the uh, that our heroes are facing, uh, unbeknownst <laughs> to them. <laughs> Here we go, Matt. What did you have? Uh, what did you think about this? I continue to be impressed with how Lewis does create a stark dichotomy between. And I go back to what you said in the very beginning, Kristen, of the darkness and the light of Terra. Oh, I'm not going to say it wrong. Tessa, Saraline. <laughs> That's just. Lasseraline. Saraline. There we go. Lasseraline. Um, Lasseraline. There we go. Um, obviously, she's not necessarily, she's, 
she's not evil by any stretch and i agree with that you, you just see like people that aren't necessarily coming to the light this either in her case a shallowness or in other case the evilness um i think lewis just paints a very strong dichotomy there and since a lot of times children are reading this book like it really just makes the parent which way do you want to live you want to be like the ghost with a very wraith-like emptiness or do you want to live with substance and tangibility and and virtue and stuff and i feel like this is just another example because you you hear about rabba dash and you hear about his father like ah whatever who really cares like there's no love there it's like all right well i've got many more this is mutually beneficial potentially either way it's a win-win for me uh, you just you really do see how shallow or how empty one way of living is in this book. Mm. Absolutely. And if if I were reading this book to children, um, one of the things that I would point out is that uh, Rabidash's name sounds like rabid and like rash. Uh, OK, yep. and he is both of those things. And the scripture talks about how a quick tempered man does foolish things. I think he's a great example of when we react in anger and resentment and in ego and fury. We do really stupid things. Mm -hmm. He's about to make it the mistake of his life. And that's that's a point that we can see. He's a great example for us of what happens when we lead with our ego. We lead with our pride, our injured pride, uh, and we respond in anger rather than in wisdom. Mm -hmm. And also, what does Rabadash do? He makes Eros a god. He has distorted love for Susan. Yeah. You only have to read how he describes her. It's like, this isn't love. He wants to control her. He wants to possess her. It's a commodity. He commodifies her. The vizier says, oh, to hear is to obey. Uh, nothing will seem as pardonable, if not estimable in their eyes, uh, as this hazardous attempt, especially because it is undertaken for the love of a woman. And we'll remember in our in the four loves, how Lewis says, when a man says, I really want a woman, it's exactly a woman that he doesn't want. He only wants that biological apparatus that will satisfy his own desires. And so he doesn't really want Susan. Um, I think that he would probably tire of Susan, certainly as soon as her looks began to go. He doesn't want her at all. What he wants is himself. Um, and yeah, he's going to get it. By the way, Matt, I had to look this up. A puff, a puff the gems. He says, it is not like ours full of choice apothegms and useful maxims, but is all of love and war. A pathogem is a terse, witty saying, and I had no idea what was going on there. So hmm. uh, I looked it up. I love it. One other thing that I'm, I'm going to have to mention, but I don't want to because Andrew's going to talk about it till we have faces again. But they talk about <laughs> consuming Narnia. So I'm going to link it to the four loves instead. It is about consumption. And I think it's also really telling the way that Narnia is described in this meeting. Because Narnia is both compared to a slave, such as Shasta, mm -hmm. and a horse. Mm -hmm. The prince says, but why, oh my father, why should we think twice about punishing Narnia any more than about hanging an idle slave or sending a worn out horse to be made into dog meat? Mm, yeah. Absolutely. And there's this idea of consumption, the loving, the consuming were all the same. Um, and that's the, we get that idea too in, in, in the four loves because, well, never mind, you know why it's in the four loves. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this commodification, this idea that I would take something and use it for my own benefit. It's love is always giving out, um, not consuming. And that's the great irony of the Eucharist, right? It's, consuming but in consuming we ourselves are consumed by god right when we come to the eucharist with a, the great surrender we allow ourselves to be swallowed up in god and so this idea of swallowing and consumption is a good idea as long as it's, as it's turned the right way and it's just screw tape all over again it's straightening out what's bent all of these things fear anger women consumption all of these things are good things when they're turned towards God and terrible when they're turned away from him. Hmm. And that's the last call bell. <laughs> we hope that you haven't been bored by our loquacity. We obviously still have half the book still to go and we will be talking through that next episode. But before we sign off, Kristen, where can people go to find out more about you and pick up a copy of your book, A Family Guide to Narnia? Oh, thank you. Um, well, A Family Guide to Narnia is available on Amazon or christianbook.com, uh, any Christian bookseller or, or bookseller in general, I think I will have it. 
And uh, you can find out about me on my website, Kristen Ditchfield. Dot com And that's just like it sounds, ditch in a field. But the Christian part is tricky. Uh, my, my parents were full of faith in Jesus and, and so excited and on fire for him when I was born. Uh, they named me Christ in. So, <laughs> so, uh, like yeah. so Kristen, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N, Kristen Ditchfield.com. Well, and I'm here in my room behind me is my eBay closet and I'm going to get my eBay stuff all all set up. Maybe one of the things I can carry as a stock item is a signed copy of your book. Sure. Mm. So, uh, we'll do that for a, not even a princely sum. <laughs> that and $5 will get you half a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Exactly. <laughs> thanks again to Kristen for joining us through this book. And thanks to all of our listeners, patron supporters, and particularly our top tier supporters. Angela, Deborah One, Deborah Two, Marvin, Joel, Thomas, Anonymous, Bill, Joanna, Snort, Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. If you've enjoyed this discussion, please share it on social media and tag us. We're on all the major platforms, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and we're still trying to bring it back. MySpace. MySpace. <laughs> and in next episode, we will be finishing The Horse and His Boy. So please join us then. When we'll be going... Further up. And further in. Cheers. 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 Cheers.